tax base. Right. Good afternoon. Testing, one, two, three. Okay. I think we've, we've got everybody and we're ready to go now. We're, we are live, correct? Yes. Great. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Guy Gazzoni and I'm uh, uh, honored to be chairing the Senate Budget and Tax Committee. Today we have a, uh, a very interesting and very important uh, hearing um, on the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. Um, obviously, we all have known and heard about this, but we're fortunate to have um, a, a great deal of expertise to discuss it. This is a, uh, a joint hearing um, between the Budget and Tax Committee, the House Appropriations Committee, and also two of our joint committees that we feel are very relevant to the issues at hand. Um, the Joint Committee on Federal Relations, um, chaired by uh, Senator Jill Carter and Delegate Al Carr, and the Joint Committee on Management of Public Funds, uh, chaired by Senator Malcolm Augustine and Delegate Pat Young. Um, so we are um, uh, a good chunk, actually, of, of the legislature, um, certainly the parts that care largely about the budget and um, uh, really uh, pleased to have everyone here and pleased to have the lineup that we have. Um, this money um, and the, the efforts of the federal government have made a dramatic uh, improvement to our budgeting situation. And uh, uh, I know that uh, we're all very anxious to hear more about uh, some updates on all that. And with that, I will turn this over to uh, the House Appropriations uh, Chair, Maggie McIntosh. Thank you very much, Chairman. And let me echo uh, the sentiments of Chairman Gazzoni. Uh, welcome to everyone. And in particular, welcome to our partners uh, and the other subcommittees that are very interested uh, in this. Uh, not only did this, these funds from the federal government okay. help us all right, let me uh, let me jump. I think um, I think Cheryl arrived, uh, and not only did these um, um, funds help us uh, really breach uh, or close a gap in our budget process this year, but it helped us as a state help so many hundreds of thousands of citizens who were struggling with rent. Uh, struggling with food insecurities, uh, str struggling to get health care, and struggling to meet their everyday needs because of what the pandemic had done to their family. Uh, so this is, uh, 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 gave us an opportunity to really not only help our citizens uh, get through the pandemic uh, in a more positive way, but help families recover in Maryland. So we are very fortunate, by the way, to have two great United States senators uh, who are with us today uh, as a part of this uh, briefing. And so with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, the senior senator from the state of Maryland, uh, Senator Benjamin Cardin. Well, Maggie, first of all, thank you very much, Madam Chair and Guy, Mr. Chair, and all of my friends in the, in the legislature. Um, I think you all know um, I cherish the service I had in the Maryland General Assembly. It was a special time and with special relations, and you can never duplicate that. And clearly, it's a much more collegial body and a much more hands-on body than the United States Congress or Senate. So I very much appreciate the opportunity of being back before you. Uh, and I must say, I've had the honor now of representing Maryland for 15 years in the Senate, and I've had two amazing partners. Uh, Barbara Mikulski, when I first came, I couldn't have had a better friend uh, and a better mentor than Barbara Mikulski and, and how we can represent all the people of Maryland. And that relationship, uh, as far as a partnership, has only gotten stronger with Senator Van Hollen. The two of us confer regularly. Uh, we divide our responsibility through committee assignments, but we work in unity for, for the people of Maryland. So I uh, 
I'm very proud of our unity among our two United States senators. That's not the case in most states, even when they have two senators of the same party. Uh, but we've been able to, to work very closely in unity together. And we work uh, with uh, the entire congressional delegation. So it is Team Maryland, very much Team Maryland. Uh, we rec work very closely with you all, with the governor, with our county execs and county council and municipal leaders uh, in order to, to benefit the state of Maryland. So I know you, this putting four committees together at one time is uh, is really a, quite an honor for all of us. Uh, so uh, we recognize that your principal interest is, is, is how the federal government has increased its partnership uh, during COVID-19. And uh, let, let me just point out, a lot of these bills have already been enacted, the CARES Act, the Omnibus Appropriation Bill in December, uh, the American Rescue Plan, uh, those bills are law. So, and you all have taken advantage of it. I brag all the time about the transparency exercised by the Maryland General Assembly and how you dealt with the 3.7 billion that was made available as a result of, of COVID legislation. Not, most states didn't do it that way. A lot of the local governments have not done it the way you have done it. You, you have been a very, very transparent and very open in assuming your responsibilities uh, in, in the most positive way. Now, those funds have not all been expended. There are still uh, issues concerning uh, the programs that have already been enacted, and I'm more than happy to try to respond to those types of questions. As you know, in addition to the funds that are made directly available to the federal government, we in Maryland had about $2.3 billion made directly available to our counties and municipalities. Uh, those funds are, are currently being uh, encumbered. They're not completely been used up yet. And there are certain requests to the Congress to modify the time in which the funds can be spent and the manner in which they can be spent. So uh, I just want you to know that is under consideration here. And we always welcome your thoughts as to whether additional flexibility is needed. Uh, we do trust you and we want you to have maximum flexibility, but we want the, the rest of the nation to do what you have done and demand transparency as these decisions are being made. Now, there are at least two other bills that are working their way through Congress that could have a dramatic impact on that partnership. One is the bipartisan infrastructure package uh, bill. That bill has passed the United States Senate. Uh, Speaker Pelosi indicates that will be voted on in the, the House as early as next week. Its fate is still not known because of its relationship to the budget reconciliation or the the, the Build Back Better budget that President Biden is working on. There are two interrelated bills and both have dramatic impact on that partnership. But let me just brag a little bit about what we have in the uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure package. Yes, it's uh, the largest increase ever in the road programs, in the bridge programs, uh, in the transit programs, uh, in the uh, broadband, uh, in the uh, water projects. I serve as chair of the subcommittee on transport uh, on infrastructure uh, of the Environment Public Works Committee. Our bill, which was reported out over six months ago, is incorporated in that. Uh, there's some really good things for the state of Maryland, such as the reauthorization of the WMATA program for the next 10 years. We keep alive the red line in Baltimore. We provide funding, direct funding, to eliminate lead in pipes, which is critically important in the state of Maryland, where we have so many. Uh, old pipes that are still um, uh, connected that contain lead. Uh, we do uh, 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 economic and social justice provision and transportation, recognizing the injustices that have been done in the past through transportation projects. The most uh, notable example is the Franklin Mulberry Corridor in Baltimore uh, to have remedial funds available to deal with that. Uh, they're just some of the issues that are included in the uh, in the uh, bipartisan uh, infrastructure package, but we go much, much further in the the uh, reconciliation budget. Now, that's far from the finish line, although the time limit to consider these bills are only within the next couple of weeks. In that uh, uh, reconciliation package, there are significant funds for climate. We make a real commitment on climate. We make a real commitment on workforce by dealing with affordable childcare, by, by dealing with affordable higher education, 
by paid family and medical leave. Uh, we make a real commitment to deal with poverty in this country by extending the tax provisions that, that allow families to be able to get, stay out of poverty. Uh, th there's a whole host of major initiatives. We expand the healthcare system, we expand Medicare, we expand the Affordable Care Act, uh, we take on prescription drug costs. Uh, so there's, uh, we take on affordable housing in a way that we haven't in my entire career, a real, real commitment to deal with affordable housing. Uh, and I could go over some of the specifics, including the Neighborhood, Neighborhood Reinvestment Act, which I authored with Senator Portman, a uh, bipartisan bill that's incorporated in this that really deals with a lot of neighborhoods in Maryland where the cost of construction or acquisition is beyond the means of the, the people who live in the community. And we do something to make up that difference through the tax code so that we can get more home ownership. So we are really are working on a very comprehensive package. Uh, we're not there yet. There's a difference within the Democrats. This is a partisan package. It requires all 50 senators to be on the board. Democratic senators, we don't have that yet, but then we have to reconcile between the House and Senate, and there's significant differences between the House and Senate. It will affect your work, not only in the revenues and programs, but also in how we handle the tax code, which has a direct impact on the Maryland tax code, and we recognize that, and we, we want to make sure that you are aware of what we're doing, and you have adequate time in order to make adjustments if you need to make adjustments in the, in the Maryland uh, tax code. Let me just mention one or two other points and then we can uh, open it up for questions. And uh, as soon as Senator Van Hollen uh, rise, I'm sure he'll, he'll, he'll add to what I said. Uh, uh, man, man, uh, are you there? Okay, great. Man, could, I, could I just, um, and I apologize, um, and Senator Cardin has covered these issues beautifully. Thank all of you for your good work. I'm going to try and get back on this, but I have in like a minute and a half, I have to be at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, or my time for questioning will run out. So uh, I'm hoping to circle back with you um, and uh, answer any questions that you may have. And so sorry for that, but uh, you all are in a legislative body, you know how it is. Try to be right back with you. Yeah, we, we're not as fortunate as you all. Usually your hearings are when you're not in voting session. We have voting sessions and multiple hearings going on at the same time. And I must tell you, it's been the only advantage of COVID uh, we can do this uh, through uh, internet connection, so I can pretend like I'm at three places at one time. So that's been probably the only advantage of COVID-19. Let me just conclude by telling you there are some other avenues available. We have the annual budget process, and that's moving along rather rapidly. Bipartisan agreements going to provide substantially more partnership funds. I can mention, I can, let me just one that's particularly important to all of us. Uh, Mid-Bay construction funds are in the budget. We're going to get that done. So we're going to be no gap between Poplar Island and Mid-Bay in regards to being able to have environmental restoration sites uh, dealing with uh, uh, our dredging. I must tell you, I'm also working with the Army Corps on beneficial use so we can take dredge material and use it at Blackwater and other facilities like that to restore uh, wetlands. So we are, we are working within the budget process also, and that's going to be coming up uh, in, in time. We're working very closely with Mayor Scott and the people in the, the Baltimore City people in regards to violent crime. Uh, Baltimore is going to be eligible for community initiative uh, funds uh, dealing with violence. Uh, we've worked hard on that. We're expecting to get them some significant resources to deal with the crime issue in, in Baltimore City. Uh, we are laser focused on the FBI for Prince George's County. Uh, we are working very aggressively. So Congressman Hoyer is going to call a meeting with Chief of Staff of the President uh, to, to engage the President directly on this issue. So I just really wanted to know there's a lot of things going on in the midst of all this. We have an October 1 continuing resolution we got to get passed. We have a debt ceiling limit that is a ridiculous thing that we vote on after we, after we spend money or commit money, we have to raise the debt ceiling in order to pay our bills, which is uh, an anomaly of our system. But that comes up in October. So uh, you, you'll hear about the, the, the partisan division we have now and the continuing resolution. I hope we can resolve that. We certainly need to resolve it before the end of this month. So there's a lot of things going on that are going to have a direct impact. If we miss the debt ceiling or continuing resolution, it has a direct impact on Maryland, on your work, and obviously on your finance. 
So I'd be glad to, to try to answer some questions uh, or provide additional information. Our, our staff has made uh, lots of documents available to your staff. Uh, we, we try to make this as easy as we can. Uh, there's been one significant change in this appropriation cycle. We now have congressional earmarks that are back. We've uh, pre pre uh, prepared a document that explains how those earmarks work. Uh, the earmark process is pretty much complete for this year, but starting in uh, for FY23, we are already soliciting areas where you think we can work together uh, in directing specific funds to go into projects that are eligible for earmarks. Uh, and we welcome your input in that process as well. So uh, let me ask the members uh, uh, for any questions and please use the, um, the hand raise function um, in Zoom. Senator Carter. Go ahead, Senator Carter. Thank you, Chairman Gazzoni. And, and thank you, Senator Cardin and all of the um, colleagues on this call. Um, I'm Senator Jill Carter, just for the purpose of the public. And along with Delegate Alcar, I'm chair of the Committee on Federal Relations. And so earlier in summer, Senator Cardin, um, we discussed the desire to meet with you all, our federal partners, to talk about um, how we could work together to help shepherd or navigate um, these funds to the people and communities that need them. Um, we, we understand that we have this one time um, wonderful opportunity to have resources where we've not had them before. And as we know, we've got um, communities and neighborhoods and infrastructure in Baltimore desperately in need of, of benefiting from this. And so um, my interest is in making sure that we can continue the communications um, regarding educating our constituencies um, and organizations and groups as how they can avail themselves of the resources that are made available. Um, you talked about the violent crime. We know that that is inextricably intertwined with the issue of lead poison in Baltimore. And there are these resources for lead infrastructure. And so I, so the question and comment, one, the, the comment, as I've said, is we'd like to figure out how to continue to work with you to educate and steer the funding exactly where it's needed. We don't want um, anything to get lost uh, lost in, in bureaucracy. We want to make sure that we benefit as much as possible. And then also the question is um, for you, maybe for now, or just a lot as we go through the process of what, if any additional um, safeguards or guardrails we can put in to ensure that we avail ourselves in a timely way of the money and resources that are made available. And thank you, and I'll, I'll go back. Yeah. You. Well, Senator Carter, thank you for that question. Uh, uh, you're exactly right in the way you asked it. I am very proud of what we were able to accomplish during the Trump administration and Republican-controlled Senate dealing with some of these equity issues during COVID-19. We were able to target funds to underserved communities. Uh, we, we were able, for example, uh, to, to move forward uh, on uh, several of the issues during the uh, COVID-19 uh, related funds, getting money into, into uh, underserved communities for vaccinations, uh, dealing with the health, public health in underserved communities, uh, we were able to get monies into uh, governments uh, that are, were targeted to underserved programs, uh, underserved community programs. But then once we had President Biden, once we got control of the Senate, we have gone on overdrive to really make sure we target those who really need the help. So you'll see in the bipartisan infrastructure package, a substantial amount of funds going to help uh, environment, environmental justice issues, social justice issues on the, uh, the uh, reconciliation budget, we recognize that it's the uh, minority communities that are the most adversely impacted by climate change. We put a ton of resources in to deal with underserved communities on the climate change and on adaptation. Uh, we, we focus the $25 billion that I had, that's $25 billion, the deal with small businesses is almost totally dedicated 
to partnerships between HBCUs and minority serving institutions to develop incubators and accelerators and innovation programs with small businesses that have been left out of the economic opportunity in our country. Uh, what we put in the bipartisan package, the codification of the Minority Business Development Agency, uh, which gives um, strong help to minority communities and economic opportunities. So you're, you're exactly right. Uh, there is a focus on just about every one of our programs to reach the communities that have been traditionally left out. And I thank you for raising that because that's a commitment President Biden made, and that's a commitment that our leaders have made. And I can tell you, we're carrying that out. We're going to make sure we, we, we deliver. Um, Delegate uh, Trent Kettleman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Senator Cardin, I remember when you were Speaker of the House, it was my husband's first year in the house back when the day's uh, votes in the in the chamber were actually close uh and i always looked at you as someone who was fiscally uh responsible my question is obviously money has to be spent but we seem to be going over the edge uh, and down the rabbit hole i i wonder if there's any discussion in the senate and the house of how we're going to repay this multi-trillion dollar debt or if not, how it's going to be handled if it comes due. If China says, I want my money back. Well, thanks for that question, because you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, first of all, I do pride myself in being fiscally responsible. I've come forward with proposals that I think would be a better finance structure for our nation, a better budget system for our nation. Uh, and I've worked with Republicans in order to try to get those proposals adopted. So I, I'm very mindful of, of the concerns that you've raised. Uh, and I was part of the Congress that actually balanced the federal budget. That's one of my proudest uh, accomplishments uh, that we actually did balance the federal budget. Uh, I, I wanna take exception uh, now. Once we went into COVID-19, uh, I met with economists and they told us it was desperate that we get as much money out in the economy as we possibly can. When we had a total shutdown of the economy, and we did basically as a result of COVID-19, in order to keep our economy afloat, it was important for us to get money out as quickly as possible. And I'm proud that Democrats and Republicans came together with the CARES Act that put a boatload of money out, not offset, just money out in the economy, and it worked, it worked. We save families, we save jobs, we save businesses. And that when we look back at this pandemic and look at the potential economic damage that it could have done to our country, we avoided that. We, we got damaged, don't get me wrong. A lot of people got really badly hurt during COVID-19, but we didn't go through a great depression like we did in, 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 the, in the early 30s. We, we were able to avoid that type of catastrophic event. So now let's go to two other events that we're talking about. One that I strongly disagreed with, both are partisan events. When the Republicans passed their 2017 tax bill, I thought it was a major disaster from a lot of different points of view. But the major disaster to me was on the budget because it added a trillion dollars of additional debt. And it has, the, we, the, the, the verdict's in. It reduced our revenues by about a trillion dollars and without offsets. So we, we went uh, and there was no reason in 2017 for us to put another trillion dollars into the economy. And I might argue we went to the wrong people, but that's a se second issue. As we're looking at the infrastructure bill and as we're looking at the uh, uh, reconciliation budget, we are looking at offsets so that we don't go further into debt. Do I think the offsets are right on the bipartisan infrastructure package? No. I don't think they're as strong as they should be. And I've said that, I said that on the floor of the Senate. I think it's important we pass the bill, but I am disappointed it doesn't have stronger offsets. I think it should have had stronger offsets. We offered stronger offsets, but we couldn't get bipartisan support for it. I can tell you, we will not pass this reconciliation budget without strong offsets. Uh, we don't have the votes to do it, first of all, and it's the right thing to do. So we will have offsets. Now you may not like all those offsets, uh, it's what we're going to do at long last is give the IRS the funds they need to audit returns so that people pay their fair share of taxes. 
uh, the, the, our, our bean counters tell us that we're, we're losing somewhere around a trillion dollars a year in uncollected taxes. That's a trillion dollars a year in uncollected taxes. So we're going to collect a, a large part of those taxes moving forward. And, and secondly, uh, we are going to raise uh, the taxes on large corporations and wealthy people who have avoided taxes for too long. So th they're the two areas where you're going to see an offset. But the net going into the economy is going to be pretty flat as a result of these issues. It, admittedly, it'll go up on the on the infrastructure package. Uh, it probably will go up somewhat on the uh, on the reconciliation, but not by three point five trillion dollars or one point two trillion dollars. Thank you, Senator Rosenthal. Hey, Jim. And uh, hey. I'm uh, again. I apologize to everybody for having to uh, jump off for a minute to ask questions, but uh, I'm back if there are any any questions for me as well. Thank uh, thank you. And Chris, yeah. have you have you made your second vote? Oh, I've not voted. No, I I was just doing my questioning in foreign relations. Um, you I made better... your first vote. I hope. Did you make the first vote? I made the first vote. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you, you what, I'll go up and make the second vote and I'll come right back down. So I'll leave it to you right now. Okay. You, you know how much time is left on that? Sorry, everybody. <laughs> so. All right. Thanks. Let me check that too. All right. Um, again, I apologize for having to jump. That's, uh, uh, and we, we apologize for sort of throwing you in the midst of this, the questioning and such. And I know we, we would have, uh, I don't know if you want to say a, a couple words first, or do you want to just keep going with the questioning? It's really it's up to sure. You. I, I will be very uh, brief, uh, guy, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and uh, thank you to uh, Chair McIntosh and uh, to the members of the Federal Relations uh, Committee and the Joint Committee on Management of Public Funds. Um, uh, it, it is great to be with you. Uh, it, like as Senator Cardin uh, mentioned, I have incredibly warm and fond memories of my time in the state legislature, and I'm. Uh, you, you were able to get things done, um, and I'm grateful for everything you did to help the state navigate the very difficult um, 18 months that we've been through with the pandemic and our efforts to try to finish it off. Uh, and when I say all you've done, I mean both on the healthcare front uh, as well as measures you've taken uh, with respect to you know helping families, small businesses, businesses across the spectrum, um, and of course. Uh, school systems, transit systems, state and local governments. And, you know, the federal government uh, did step up, um, as you know, in terms of a series of measures. And uh, we look forward to working with you to make sure that those funds are uh, put to their uh, best uh, use. And as Senator Card mentioned, um, we're, we're, we're now involved in trying to get these, the, the better part of what President Biden calls the Build Back Better agenda um, into uh, law and across the finish line, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And then, of course, uh, the other part of the Build Back Better agenda, which includes many important things, universal early education, uh, affordable quality child care. You know, there are a lot of people who are not back in the workforce because uh, parents want to know that their kids are in a, a safe uh, place um, and, you know, in a, with quality um, measures um, in order to go back into the workforce. So those are among the things, including uh, moving to a clean energy economy and all the opportunity that brings uh, as well. So uh, I don't want to go on because I'm sure you have uh, questions and I'm happy to try and answer any uh, questions you, you've got. Uh, thank you for being great partners um, in working together uh, for all the people of the state because um, as I've told you all before, they, they call you, they call us, they call state and local officials, but there are shared um, constituents and citizens, uh, and we, we just have to work together uh, to make sure that um, we succeed as a state. Thank, thank you, Senator. We're very lucky to have you and Senator Card. Um, and, and there are uh, uh, a number of questions uh, teed up already. Um, so let me go back to Senator Rosenthal. Thank you very, very much. And thanks for being with us. But if you have to go vote, go vote. More important for you to be there voting than being with us. So don't worry about us in that regard. Um, the question I want to ask is, you know, everybody talks about dysfunction in Washington and everybody fights with each other and they can't, you can't get stuff done. But the fact of the matter is this year, you and Senator Cardin and the 
Congress and the president have gotten a lot done. And my question is, the three big things on the on the on the uh, schedule right now are the debt ceiling, the infrastructure package, and reconciliation. My question really is, and you can't predict the future. I got that. What do you think the likelihood is that one, two, or three of those things will be done by the time we go into session in January? Well, let me start with the debt ceiling because we have to get that done uh, before you go into session in January. Secretary Yellen has uh, estimated that we will um, you know, trip the wire on the debt ceiling sometime between mid-October and mid-November. And uh, you know, that, that would be disastrous for the state. You know, in the Maryland legislature, you don't have uh, a requirement that once you pass something, uh, you have to vote again uh, to ensure you pay for it. Now, obviously, uh, we have a budget system in Maryland, very different than the federal level. But the reality is raising the debt ceiling is designed to pay for the bills that are already due and owing by the federal government. Um, so it, it would be like us waking up one day and deciding we're not going to make our mortgage payment or not going to make our car payment, except for on a national scale where we jeopardize the full faith and credit of the United States, which is Senator Cardin and I were just earlier this morning on with the Maryland Chamber of Commerce. Um, and, you know, the business community from the National Chamber of Commerce uh, to uh, every sort of business organization association at the federal level has urged the Congress not to make a big political drama of this because it would be catastrophic for our economy. So uh, the House has just uh, passed that yesterday along with a continuing resolution uh, to keep the government open and funded through December 5th. As, as you know, I mean, we feel it more in Maryland than, than uh, most other states, but uh, if we don't uh, get a continuing resolution by the end of this month, then you're talking about the self-inflicted wound of a government shutdown. Uh, with all the terrible consequences of that. So they passed a measure that has three elements, um, continuing resolution, uh, then uh, emergency uh, support for uh, the storm relief and some of the emergency relief around the country. Uh, and third, a, an extension of the debt ceiling to December of 2022. Uh, so we got to get that done, Jim. The other two, I, I also think we will uh, get done. It's a bumpy road. Um, and uh, we've obviously got to make sure that we, we work together. Um, one bill is bipartisan. The other, as you know, uh, has not been. Um, and we're trying to you know, piece together a, a solution that, that gets both these pieces uh, across uh, the finish line. Thank you. Senator Carosa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks to both of our U.S. Senators for being on the Zoom with us. Um, I wanted to follow up on some of the interaction between, um, I know the um, both U.S. Senators staff and Congressman Harris's staff have been uh, working with the Salisbury Chamber of Commerce on the push for the restaurant relief fund, the replenishment of it. I just wanted to underscore that um, the uh, hospitality industry, the restaurant industry has been among the hardest hit and that there has been a push um, to uh, replenish uh, these restaurant funds. So I wanted to check on the staff, understand that, you know, if we were able to decouple this from the infrastructure bill, we would um, maybe be in a better position. So again, wanted to take this opportunity um, to raise that priority, um, you know, with our um, Senate and congressional representatives. Well, Senator, well thank you. Chris, oh, let, let me, let me, I'm back. Okay, well, let me just good. cover this because it, it's not in the reconciliation. It's not in the bipartisan package. It's going to be a standalone bill. Uh, we tried to get it done by unanimous consent. It's bipartisan. Senator Van Hollen and I are both strong proponents of replenishing the funds. Uh, and we, uh, I've authored the legislation with Senator Wicker, a Republican from Mississippi. It enjoys strong bipartisan support. We need $48 billion more to satisfy the need. We shouldn't be shocked by that number. Let me just remind people the Paycheck Protection Program needed an additional $300 billion after we after the first round of funds. So uh, it, 
we have a near unanimous support in, in the Senate, but we don't have unanimous support. Uh, one senator objected when we tried to get it done. Uh, so I have circulated a letter uh, to our colleagues uh, getting their input. And Senator Schumer has assured us that we're going to have an opportunity on the floor uh, to, to try to get this done. So uh, uh, there's nothing guaranteed in life. I can assure you of that. But we are working hard, Senator Van Hollen and I, to get those funds replenished. Thank you. Let me just say it's a it's a priority and thank Senator Cardin for all his uh, work on this. And now I, I do have to go uh, vote. Um, mm -hmm. And if uh, you're still going well, when I, this, I look yeah, well, this may be a good time. I don't see any more questions at the moment. Um, so it's a great time, I think, maybe to thank you uh, both um, for being here um, and sharing your time on what is clearly a very busy day. Uh, for you in, in Washington. And um, and uh, we, we love the partnership. We love working with you. And we're very grateful. Thank you Thanks very you. much. Thank you, Thanks very you much. all very much. So uh, next up, uh, we have Secretary Brinkley, mm -hmm. um, Department of ba uh, Man uh, Budget and Management. Yes. Secretary, are you there? I am. Can you hear us okay? We can. Okay, perfect. I love that. I love that. I didn't that. know if the technology was going to work. Uh, I, I think we got a twofer here. You do have a twofer. Uh, I think everybody needs to put their shades on as he and I dip our heads like this and we feel blind <laughs> with the, all the reflection coming back. I noticed yeah. that on this camera uh, uh, angle that we have. So, um, uh, Madam Chairman, Mr. Chair of the uh, Senate Budget and Tax Committee, it's great to be in front of you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm David Brinkley. I'm the Secretary of the Department of Budget and Management. And uh, it's our pleasure to be here. With me is Deputy Secretary Mark Nicole. And uh, you'll see that he has lots of papers spread out in front of him in the event that we get, uh, get down into the weeds. Hopefully these are the weeds and have a little more detail. Uh, we're going to attempt to do a, a broad overbrush uh, to tell you where we are uh, in, in uh, dealing with some of this with the ARPA funding. Um, you know, and I, I do also want to just say something that Senator Cardin had said. I don't know if he's still here, but we do uh, appreciate that he acknowledged the, the, the effort which we're constantly taking uh, to, to make whatever data that we have uh, available and public and transparent. Uh, our report, I think you told me uh, that we submitted to the federal government was what, 73 or 74 pages uh, that we had to uh, report to them. We understand one state submitted a one page report. Uh, so we're trying to be as detailed as we can uh, and uh, uh, just, just lay whatever data we have out. We don't have all the answers, but we certainly are trying to stay on top of it. If you turn to, to the next slide, uh, this is just a real quick summary of the American Rescue Plan, or as we affectionately refer to as ARPA. You'll see that the state fiscal relief was 3.7 billion, local fiscal relief 2.3 billion. Uh, when I talk about those two, that's what we're really going to dive into in the rest of this conversation. But it's important that everybody knows that nearly $12 billion in grant funding uh, was allocated for Maryland's usage in various uh, uh, forms. You can see how that's all set up up there, the elementary and secondary school relief to the tune of $2 billion, transit funding, 0.9 billion uh, or 900 million, rental and homeowner assistance, uh, $600 million, higher education relief, another 600 million, child care funding, a half billion dollars, some capital projects to $200 million, school testing, uh, small business credit initiative of $200 million, and just about everything else when you wrap into that of $700 million. That's an awful lot of money coming to us on a $20 billion budget that we normally have. Basically over half uh, of our general fund budget is coming to us in this year. We have a couple of years to go through this, uh, but this is what we want to spend most of our time today is, is addressing the top two issues that we have. So if we can turn to the next slide. The $3.7 billion within ARPA is the state fiscal relief fund. You'll see us refer to that as we go forward as the SFRF. 
uh, and the allowable uses we delineate here, respond to the COVID-19 public health emergency or negative in economic impacts. Those were the most important issues that we, uh, we faced. And, and I have to uh, acknowledge that whenever we have conversations with the governor or anybody else from out of state, uh, I did a, uh, a presentation with council of state governments. One of the things that we highlighted was the fact that we communicated with the legislature as we were dealing with all this. We also have a premium pay for eligible workers of nearly $100 million, provision of government services related to the reduction of uh, revenue. You're going to hear us talk a good bit about that uh, in a little bit. And then certain capital investments were allowed for water, sewer, wastewater, or broadband infrastructure. Um, to the two chairs, you're well aware of this, but uh, the governor and the legislature reached an agreement on how to spend the $3.7 billion uh, that, we, that was indicated that was gonna be forthcoming to us. A lot of other states didn't do that. They didn't have some type of uh, conversations going on ahead of time. Some of the states were still in their budget uh, uh, conversations as late as uh, June and July, as they were trying to wrap some things up. When we submitted, just a reminder, when we submitted the budget in January, we ignored any type of federal money that might be forthcoming. We knew there was going to be a lot of money forthcoming. We didn't know what provisions we would have to do to spend it, or not, not what to do, but what our restrictions would be, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And you saw that rolled out incrementally in our supplemental budgets, and the final budget, supplemental number five, included much of the funding that we have here and uh, basically the, uh, uh, the essence of the agreements that we had with the legislature as we move forward. If we turn the slide, uh, the next two pages summarize uh, where that agreement uh, lined up uh, a lot of this money. Up to $1.1 billion to shore up the state's unemployment insurance trust fund. We all know the impact that that had on all of our employers when they went from a rate of A down to the bottom rate of F, uh, you passed emergency legislation enabling us to try to get them to rate schedule C and try to hold the line on that. Uh, and that's our, our goal here as we move forward. And the budget amendment uh, to do this was just uh, recently submitted and moved forward. The $800 million is to support existing pandemic relief, the Recovery Now program spending that we have, uh, the economic impact payments, some of this uh, the governor had gone into with the rainy day fund for last year. Now we can uh, try to direct some of those just to make sure. Keep in mind that when those decisions were made, time was of the essence. Uh, our employers couldn't wait for the legislature to come into session and then uh, strike whatever deals were going to be struck and then get, get money on the street. We had to ensure that some restaurants had the capacity to, to keep their doors open going through the winter time. Uh, and so that's what some of that was, was allocated toward. Uh, $600 million for the support of safe reopening of our schools. We know that uh, the devastating impact that it had with kids not being in the classroom. Uh, our mission is to get them back into the classroom, but we also now, particularly with, uh, with the new variant of, of COVID, uh, have to do so as, as safe of a, a process as we can and also based on the latest information from CDC and, and uh, our health authorities. $500 million to improve transportation services and certain infrastructure. Uh, we are also anxiously awaiting what will happen with the infrastructure bill in Washington to see what impact it would have on this. I didn't say if any, we know it would have some impact, presuming they can uh, get it passed. And then we'll have to, to perhaps make some adjustments along these lines too. But the point is, is that we reached an agreement. We want to make sure that we get those services uh, to move forward and that commitment is there. And then $300 million to support our broadband infrastructure investments and services as we go forward. If we turn the uh, slide to the next one, we're continuing with some of our uh, allocations along this line. Let's see, just waiting for the slide to turn. Well, while we're doing that, I'll just keep talking. Uh, it, it, we learned this in the Senate. We can do this as a filibuster thing. You just kind of keep, keep, keep the momentum going. I don't know if your slide is turned, but our slide is not turned here. Uh, 300 and plus million dollars to support critical lifelines for Marylanders in need, including $140 million to support the higher than estimated caseloads uh, and the costs in the temporary cash assistance programs, the TCA programs. 
$103 million to support utility bill arrearage assistance programs, and $54 million to continue the enhanced monthly benefit for Marylanders receiving TCA and temporary uh, disability assistance through 2021. And then $26 million for a temporary 2% rate increase uh, for nursing homes. I know that that was something that, that they were very, very appreciative uh, of getting that acceleration uh, uh, to come up. And um, uh, because, I mean, face, uh, frankly, they were, they were faced with some dire challenges uh, under themselves. We allocated, as I mentioned earlier, uh, up to $100 million for uh, response pay for state employees providing essential services and $75 million to expand apprenticeship and employment training programs. I'm gonna take a pause here, Mark, you're following on the notes. Is there anything I missed or anything that you want to enhance? No, I think you're good. Okay, nice answer, I like that. If we turn to slide, we see the uh, Safe Fiscal Relief Fund and its updates. Uh, we did receive, uh, I don't have that page up. Right. I think we went a little too fast. Yeah, go, go yeah, back a slide. Back another slide. There. That one. There. There we go. So keep in mind, when we entered into our uh, conversation with the legislature, we thought we were going to receive a uh, uh, valuation of X. We actually received Y uh, from the federal government. It was $178 million less than the original estimate. Uh, it's okay. We were able to work through some of this. Uh, the good news is, uh, if you can list, uh, perhaps I should have highlighted that as in a red line as being uh, not the good news. The good news is we will not be subject to a tax cut penalty provision that we thought we were going to be exposed to when we were negotiating uh, uh, with your leadership. Uh, so they, they don't quite offset, but they certainly uh, uh, help us in the right direction. We did receive lots of revised guidance from the Treasury, and they have clarified how spending can be, uh, uh, can be directed. Uh, one of the things that came out very good, because all the states were, were uh, concerned that their initial guidance was we couldn't uh, backfill, or not backfill, but help out the unemployment insurance funds. They claimed that was a tax reduction, when in fact, uh, what, what caused the hit directly uh, was uh, the COVID virus and Treasury uh, relented on that, and all the states are now able to enjoy uh, that benefit. And I, I would just want to go off script and acknowledge Mark's work on that. Uh, Mark is the former president of uh, National Association of State Budget Officers, and he was very, he's been very, very instrumental in those conversations that we have with Treasury uh, and typically with other states at the same time. So uh, we really are, are very fortunate to have a seat at that table. Uh, you, I know the chairman had seen it. I presume it's been shared. Uh, I sent a letter dated August 19th. It's a six page letter uh, delineating uh, several issues and solutions that we identified. I'll point out that while the letter's dated August 19th, that's when we had uh, validated a lot of the uh, issues we had in the, in the uh, ongoing interest of communication. I reached out to the presiding officers I'd say about a week, maybe 10 days ahead of time, just to give them a heads up. Uh, we identified some issues. We're working through them. They're going to be receiving a letter that they can share with the, the committee members uh, just as to what we identified as the issues once Washington changed some of its rules and what we proposed as uh, some solutions in moving forward. Uh, you'll see that some of the things uh, were ineligible were the Maryland Strong, the Economic Recovery Initiative. There was about a billion dollars in tax benefits uh, that we moved forward to Maryland citizens on that uh, with the earned income tax credit, some of the sales tax provisions that we've done, uh, and some of the tax credits that we extended. Uh, the, the economic impact payments and the education trust fund shortfall. But uh, in this letter, those that haven't seen it yet or, or uh, just can't recall exactly what was in it, uh, it's a commitment from us to honor the intent of our original plan. We will be introducing uh, some adjustments in the budget that you will see in January. In other words, we're going to get to where our agreement was. We're going to honor the spirit of the law. We're going to have to <clears throat> excuse me, make some changes just to satisfy the federal requirements that we have uh, so that we can get to that end and, and uh, uh, take care of it in that context. Uh, 
Anything you want to add to that? Sure. Just sort of specifically on that, uh, in the guidance that we received from the Treasury, uh, they put forward a date in, in the guidance of March 3rd, 2021. So they really said that we want the American Rescue Plan for, uh, spending to be really forward looking. So we are going to tell you states that generally the spending that is allowable is spending that occurred after March 3rd, 2021. <laughs> So those three items that are listed under those bullets there are, are three items that actually uh, we either did in, in December as the Maryland Strong Economic Recovery Initiative. The economic impact payments uh, went out uh, in late February of 2021 and the education trust fund shortfall, which is the result of the closing of the casinos, mainly occurred prior to that date. So as the secretary said, our plan is to adjust that with the budget that we submit in January. So you'll see that through a couple of different solutions, either a budget submission, perhaps some provisions to a BRFA, you know, some BRFA language or something along those lines, we'll still be identifying exactly, uh, uh, you know, furthermore what those issues are, and then uh, uh, move forward on how best to, to legislatively get that fixed, and you can anticipate that. The next slide, slide seven, uh, shows our ARPA spending summary on where we've been. You can see our original estimate was uh, about $3.9 billion, just shy of that. And my screen has not changed. I don't know if anybody else has yet or not. There we go. Uh, so we anticipated all just shy of $3.9 billion. There was you know, a tax loss provision, which wasn't that big a deal, the $133 million got us down to 3.7 that we uh, reached the agreement on. Uh, our actual allocation was 3.7 that came from the federal government. Uh, so we have an overcommitment of about $45 million in the agreement that we have with you. Uh, but we also had some uh, unspent economic impact payments of 177. So we still have $132.8 million to, to satisfy some of that. Do you wanna go into that? Uh, no, I think the only point I would, I would make there is the, the economic impact payments that, are, that say unspent, they were unspent from the American Rescue Plan. We were able to make those payments. We just use a different federal funding source. Okay, uh, so the next uh, slide, please. Good. Uh, so these are some other ideas that you'll see, uh, either you'll see in the letter, because I know the COVID-19 health reserve is mentioned in the letter. Uh, the governor announced the project restore to help some of our communities uh, with vacant space, uh, an allocation of some of those monies. We had an interpretation from the federal government uh, that we could use some of the monies to take care of some of the increased administrative support at the state level. Therefore, we can see that as an opportunity to backfill. I'll go back to that, uh, the health reserve uh, we just know that we received some benefits, for lack of a better word, in how we handled some of the Medicaid and Medicare. We think we, we, they might change the rules on us going forward. So this is just a little cushion for us to, uh, uh, to, to be able to bake in should they make some type of change. Do you want to specify more? So I would think the, the where we're sort of putting, hedging our sort of bet here is, you know, so right now FEMA public assistance is 100% federal. Uh, at some point, the federal government may change the rules around uh, those types of expenses. And if that's the case, uh, we need to have some money set aside to cover the state share of those expenses. This would be uh, one of those reserves that could be used. We don't know that it's going to happen, and we don't know the magnitude of what it would be, but we think this is being uh, uh, defensive and uh, trying to prepare ourselves for that. And uh, again, going off the script here, you know, we heard Senator Cardin talk about it. They don't pass, uh, you know, the, the, the temper that lifting the, the spending cap uh, and moving forward. Uh, they have threatened, I think I've heard in a couple of different uh, mag uh, uh, venues, that they might have to claw some of this back. Uh, as we move forward, just another side. Maryland was very fortunate. Some states were going to receive their monies in two tranches. We were very fortunate that we got all of ours in one tranche. Uh, so we don't have to await to see what happens in uh, uh, May or June to, as to whether uh, additional monies could come down. Um, you can see the other, uh, the other portions we have here, uh, GOCPYBS of 5 million max use spending. Uh, you see the vaccine bonus that we gave to state employees who were vaccinated, uh, 200 million. 
uh, or 0.2 million, uh, $200,000 and the unemployment insurance payment true up. Anything else you wanna wrap up with that? The next page, we have, uh, this is slide nine, uh, our ARPA spending to date, uh, $610 million. We had 356 million uh, in the negative economic impacts. You can see how we lay that out with business and nonprofit assistance. That was a, a big deal to get some of that going forward. Utility assistance of $93 million. Our TCA caseload of $50 million. Our suspense payments on unemployment insurance of 40 million. Uh, the enhanced TDAP benefit of 22 million. I know uh, uh, Delegate Valentino Smith's very concerned uh, along these lines. Uh, job training assistance, our emergency housing grants of 15 million, and food bank assistance of 10 million. And I think I have another conversation or uh, video call tomorrow along or something along those lines. Uh, uh, you know, the, the so I think I, the, the point I would make here is if you're looking at these programs here, a lot of this spending was. Uh, spending that uh, was included as part of the Relief Act, in particular through the uh, Recovery Now um, Fund uh, that was uh, originally supported through the Rainy Day Fund that eventually is now being supported through the American Rescue Plan. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we have been reporting on that to you. We had been reporting on that to you, with you uh, every couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, sort of big part of this is, is that particular program. Okay, slide 10. This continues uh, what we have on our to date. Uh, the premium pay was $98 million. Our healthcare provider support, again, this is something very critical, particularly as we're going into this next variant uh, and some of the challenges we have there are $52 million. Our K-12 education, 46 million. This is from the state's portion. Remember, there's still our, our, our additional uh, federal funds. They will flow through us, but they end up uh, directly at MSDE. Uh, we're acknowledging the $25 million for learning loss, behavioral health, and safe school reopenings of 10 million apiece. <clears throat> and then the DJS, uh, Juvenile Services Education of a million dollars. We have broadband infrastructure of 32 million. Again, my, my concern, I, my staff is used to hearing me say this, I kind of wonder if there are enough contractors to do all the work we're, we're paying to get it done. Uh, same thing on some of the, uh, well, just about anything on the capital side at this point. Transportation funding of $20 million and certain aid to county governments of 5 million. Do you want to specify anything else nope. on this page? Next slide, please, number 11. This is the, uh, the big wild card as we're, as we're playing this poker game for lack of a, a better example, is the revenue loss. They did, the federal government did write in a revenue loss uh, provision into this. And this is where we can identify uh, a lot of the areas where we can utilize some of the money, even if we backfill uh, through some other, uh, some other area on some of the commitments that we've made earlier. So uh, we're still going through some of the calculation on all this. You're having conversations with the comptroller's office, is that right? And what's the timeline along those lines? So, so we, in, in the report that we submitted to the federal government, we shared uh, with them our current estimate of revenue loss to be $1.6 billion. Uh, that's a calculation we're gonna have to uh, redo annually every December and, and submit that to the federal government. And keep in mind that goes across the areas of our general fund. We're looking at the sales tax and, and what we might have, you know, an opportunity loss along those lines. Also, uh, that might be the big area that we also have on transportation. Uh, when you look at all the loss that we had of people not uh, driving and certainly not crossing the Bay Bridge and some of the toll facilities, the debts on those did not stop. We kept making the payments and all to the, uh, uh, to the bondholders, but the revenue certainly was interrupted and uh, we still have maintenance to do along those lines. So uh, again, we're looking to see how this can be uh, uh, incorporated, but then depending on what the federal government does on the infrastructure bill, we will then have to web those together. <clears throat> um, so again, as I pointed out on the third bullet point, states can use federal funding to supplant certain government spending. Uh, they don't want us to use it to take care of tax reduction as it goes forward, but that's where we get into that de minimis uh, uh, category and, and none, of, none of the programs we've done have, have crossed that threshold. And then the BRE is calculated as Mark just indicated, revenue loss of about $1.6 billion. And then there's that uh, calculation done every December. 
um, the next uh, the next page. So before you, know, you go on, uh, one of the things I wanted to sort of share with all the the committee uh, members here is uh, transportation spending, which uh, as part of the agreement was about half a billion dollars. If you looked at the American Rescue Plan itself, you would see that there is no sort of place where that was sort of an allowable expense. Revenue loss is the way that we as a state are going to be able to use some of the federal money to support those transportation services and infrastructure. Okay. Next slide, slide 12, any use spending. Okay, uh, this is where we have the non-entitlement units. Those are also our municipalities, uh, in case you hadn't made that, that nexus of the 148 number. Uh, they are eligible to receive up to $529 million. They will receive it in two payments. We have received, we the state have received the money, uh, but they'll get their second tranche, I think in May, is that right? May or June? No, next summer. Next summer, okay, so next July. Uh, 124 of them have received $224 million. Keep in mind, these municipalities run the gamut, and I know you're going to hear from them later, in their size, but also in their capacity to handle some of the, uh, uh, I guess, the reporting requirements and, and, and things along those lines. We have three tiny municipalities that said, we're not going to receive anything. Uh, and that was uh, you know, up, up to $1.5 million. Uh, we have a few that we still have to work through this, but I will point out when it says on that bottom slide that the state is providing technical assistance to municipalities, uh, I'll point out that the state in this case is the Department of Budget and Management, and we have been working closely with them, and we have hired a consultant to help us navigate uh, these, uh, these areas. Mark was at MML uh, providing uh, uh, some, some counseling to them and, and getting them up to speed. We prepared the spreadsheet reporting so that they're all on the same type of uh, spreadsheet document so that that can all readily be integrated uh, and then shared with the federal government so that reporting does not become an issue. Uh, so again, when we say the 124, many of those like Frederick or Gaithersburg, Rockville, they, they have uh, fiscal teams in place. They're ready to hit the ground running and they took off and they did that. Uh, you have some others that, that look, they're all volunteer. They don't, they, uh, their only paid staff might be uh, someone that takes care of the streets or maybe uh, uh, does, they, they, well, even contract out for trash collection and things like that. They just don't have this in their, uh, in their uh, ballpark. So we're providing uh, some of that uh, technical resource to keep them up to speed. You've been doing a lot of that. Anything you want to add to this? Or sure. No, I, I, I think the only, other, the only point I would make here is that, you know, we've tried to work pretty closely with the Maryland Municipal League to have sort of regular conversations with them uh, about sort of where things stand. They are, you know, we've had to have many communications with many of these municipal governments uh, when we've needed to. They've sort of been supportive and, and, and have helped uh, in that endeavor. And we're going to uh, be presenting at the MML Fall Conference in, in about two weeks uh, with some roundtables about sort of reporting issues. So. Uh, first, there were a lot of questions about what can I use my money for? Well, one, how do I apply, get my money? Right now, the questions are around what can I spend my money on? And then very shortly, uh, just like we are going to have to do as a state, they're going to have to do their first report to the federal government on October 31st. So we want to talk to them about that in a couple of weeks. I remember we had 30 days to get them their money. <laughs> we didn't know when the money was coming in. Everybody was clamoring for it. And uh, then once it came through, trying to get it out the door, we were granted an extension to be able two to extensions. Do, two extensions to do that. And you know, we now are, are we've got hit the ground running. And uh, my bad, I apologize. You're not hearing from this group uh, at the end. I think it's Mako that you have coming in. So I stand corrected along those lines. Next slide, please. This is 13. Uh, we expect to receive $171 million for our capital projects. Uh, long allocation of this. Right now, they want the vast majority of that for broadband. Uh, the governor announced an additional $100 million allocation for broadband. Again, we're recognizing, and actually through COVID, that it wasn't just uh, the so-called rural broadband that was the issue. There's also a significant urban broadband issue. Uh, and so we're trying to ensure that we can uh, get all that uh, our mission here is just to, to, to monitor and provide guidance as we uh, understand how best to allocate it uh, between all of these that we have. 
if you want to add to that. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to keep, keep all that together uh, as we move forward. Next slide, number 14, is what we have to do on the reporting. Uh, the state submitted a comprehensive report on August 31st. Uh, you can find that on our website, the DBM website. Uh, it's an annual report that we'll have to get out. Uh, this is what I wanted to, to acknowledge Senator Cardin on, is, is that we're keeping that up to date as, as we can, uh, which I think has been very well. Our interim report, uh, we had an interim spending summary uh, that went out, and documentation about the revenue loss calculation and an NEU uh, spending summary. Uh, so we'll we'll keep moving all this forward. When's our next report? We have August 31st. October 31st. So that's the project expenditure report, which is due on uh, October 31st. So we're going to do that every quarter. Uh, and really that reporting is going to be very similar to what we've done for the coronavirus relief fund, which is uh, the state will need to provide detailed uh, information about any person, entity, government, uh, that receives a payment above $50,000, we'll re be reporting that to the federal government uh, on a quarterly basis. Yep. Good. So the next slide, <clears throat> which is our last slide, uh, where we continue to work with state agencies on identifying their performance measures and monitoring their spending. I had a presentation at the uh, cabinet meeting last week. Uh, this is uh, uh, where we were just gearing them uh, up for their 23 budget hearings, which we are starting, uh, uh, I think, in about 10 days or so. Uh, I know that I had about 66 or 67 calendar invites come across with, you know, you know when we do our internal conversations and then when we actually meet face to face with the agencies. We're trying to find some common ground on some of the reporting that we have to do. For some of them, it's not that difficult. Uh, for some, you know, we're kind of struggling to see. Uh, where we have some of that, but we would just want to make sure there's some continuity across that. We will uh, uh, maintain the spirit of what we agreed to with you. We'll just keep it in conformity with the federal uh, guidelines that we received, and we will keep uh, keep communicating with you as we see things that go in one direction. We feel we need to, if we need to zig, we'll zag, uh, but our mission is as we discover things just to keep you informed of them. And I'd like to think that we've done that uh, so far, particularly with this big issue that we had. Um, we'll keep sharing all that that we have. And if we have any questions that we can take today, we certainly will. I'll point out that uh, with all of his papers here, if he has the details in here, we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, if we don't have the details, we'll follow up and make sure that, uh, that we provide that to you. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Madam Chair, uh, Thanks. that concludes my presentation. And uh, like I say, we're prepared to take some questions. I saw some hands are up. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Chairman Gazzoni, I don't know I what it is. Erica, I want to thank Erica and Kim, whoever is handling all this, because they said, do you want to do it here? And we said, hell no, we can't even reach the keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, Chairman Gazzoni, I don't know what it is about. Um, well, I guess it's getting to, it's, it's evening out now. I was going to say that the, so for some reason, Secretary Brinkley always excites the House, and we get a lot of questions from, you know, members of the House. But I see that it's evening out, so I'll start off if you don't mind, Chairman, no. um, and we'll call first on uh, Delegate Resnick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would hope that by now Senator Brinkley would realize that the more uh, slides on the PowerPoint presentation, the more time for us to come up with questions. So. I think I'll that's on you, so, Mr. Slide. Secretary. See one slide like that statement. <laughs> um, I, I have two questions, if I may. Uh, they are related. The, the first one is more specific, uh, dealing with you know the COVID variant, the Delta variant, um, on the rise across the country and in the state as well. Uh, we are doing much better than than most other places, but it's still on the rise. And what we are seeing is a number of our state employees who deal with the variants, whether they be nurses or uh, corrections officers or others living in congregate or working in congregate facilities, uh, at this point have all but expended all of their sick and personal leave time. And uh, because the emergency paid sick leave uh, program has ended, uh, we're wondering if there are any, is there anything that you and the governor are thinking about doing in order to compensate them or maybe using some of the federal funds that we are getting in order to help out our state employees who have uh, used up all of their time 
uh, in their efforts to try and, and uh, help the people of Maryland? Good question. We, uh, I know that uh, I've seen some emails back and forth where Cindy's having some conversations preparing for negotiations. We're required to do that at this point. And I think that was one of the topics that we brought up. Uh, we're trying to, I think Cindy's doing some of the research on the magnitude of it, who has what's left. I will point out that we did have, uh, one of the big issues we had was <clears throat> people had the use it or lose it uh, personal leave from last year and, and particularly in the health fields. Uh, they were unable to use it, so we extended that into this year by administrative action, uh, where we allow them to play catch up along those lines. But that's all the personal leave that they're entitled to. It's not the sick side that you're uh, inquiring about. And uh, so uh, we'll, we'll find out where we are along those lines. Are you aware of anything else in the email that I saw back and forth? No, I didn't. No. Yeah. Okay. But it, no, it has hit our radar scope, and we're trying to gauge uh, exactly what that is. Part of the conversation is also, you know, at what point do you have vaccinated people versus unvaccinated employees and who's uh, willing to take uh, participation along those lines? My inclination is not the governor's inclination at this point in time, but, you know, we might be willing to provide some type of benefit to those who've gone to the step of getting vaccinated. But if we have an employee who refuses to get vaccinated, and in my opinion, is is helping spread the risk or share the risk uh, uh, where we don't want it shared, that individual shouldn't be entitled to that type of uh, relief. So uh, those are some of the conversations that we're having. Well, that's great. And I'd love to hear more about uh, how that progresses as we move forward. My second question is related to COVID as well. Um, again, we're not out of the woods yet. And I think we can all agree that this is still a problem. Uh, however, the governor's emergency order uh, expired months ago. And what we have been seeing since then uh, is just a lot of extra work and hassle when it comes to, uh, you know, funding the DD, you know, DD communities uh, issues or funding adult medical day or funding education programs uh, or, or others. Um, it just seems like for whatever reason, we ended the emergency program, assuming that everything was fine, knowing full well that we have a, uh, we're still sliding through this process. And we've had, and I've had numerous conversations with the Department of Health, with the Department of Social Services, trying to reinstate programs and benefits, uh, ultimately going back, getting partial, going, why not just ease everyone's concerns reinstate the emergency order or some version of it so that we don't have to keep going back and forth having extra conversations just to be able to help our constituents? Interesting question. I'm not privy to the governor's conversations with his council along the lines of that. I do know that part of it uh, was to ensure as we so-called flatten the curve, we've forgotten about that term that we heard so much about 18 months ago, <clears throat> that a lot of that was to shut down certain uh, uh, venues that we had, and by that I mean the really massive ones, so that we could do a lot of vaccinations and, and step in and, and take over some sites to do that. We've pretty much gotten to that point and passed that point. The other aspect of the emergency was to um, allow people not to be forced into getting their licenses renewed and some things along those lines. Um, and I think that we, we have certain, certainly gotten to a level of COVID's going to be with us for a long time. We're trying to make sure that the government at this point in time adapts to whatever the new normal might be, whatever it is. Uh, I hear you. I'm not privy to some of the conversations that he's had along those lines, uh, but we're also seeing that we can, we can take some steps to get some things back up and going. It's not to say that we're back at 100 percent. We're not. Uh, and that's why those are, are some of the important uh, transition points that you're bringing up. You know, we were having some issues with CCU uh, when we dealt with, you know, deferring a lot of the uh, collections that we had, and now we have a backlog there. Um, and that's just within uh, DVM itself. Um, but as we, uh, uh, I'll certainly mention it to him next time I see him and uh, uh, just see exactly where some of the stands are. I know we, we had a lot of people do pushback and, uh, because he announced it in uh, two tranches. And uh, he, he came under a lot of criticism for not shortening the state of emergency. But part of that on the August 15th date was again, uh, to allow MBA and some of these other places to ramp back up so they could continue their scheduling so we could get people back in to renew not just their driver's licenses, 
vehicle renewals, but also professional licenses and all, all those uh, different avenues that, that had to suddenly be suspended. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I hope you would take that back because from much of this, it's a financial issue. It is money, right? It's not, I understand all, uh, all the issues dealing with licenses and opening venues and that kind of a thing. But at the end of the day, it's a question of being able to get money as effectively and efficiently into the parts of our state and economy that need it. And that's why I brought it up to you. So please, yes, take it back. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. Senator King. Thank you. David, I'm, I'm sure you've gotten as many phone calls as I have about this childcare issue. Um, from what I'm hearing, there are over 800 childcare centers that have closed across the state and because they just ran out of money. And I've heard different dates on this, but I know that the, the money has been approved to give out to these childcare centers to try to get them back up and running. But now we, apparently the, the, um, the, the grant appro uh, approval people got laid off in August. So they have to rehire people now to come back and, and, and give out this money to the, for the grants. Is there any way to speed that up so that we can get these people back? Get, because we, we're not going to get people back to work until we can get their kids taken care of. Well, that, that, that part's true. And I knew that that was one of the concerns or one of the variables people were looking at is to, whether that was impacting getting people back in the workforce. Mm. Uh, certainly the child care aspect. And I wasn't aware of people being laid off, but I'll certainly uh, see what I can find out about uh, some of that. I think a lot of the child care work was done through MSDE. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, so MSDE is the one that was had been handling some of that. Maybe there's been some organizational reshuffling with the new superintendent in there. I can certainly find out. Uh, because that is one of the goals we have is to ensure that some of these folks uh, can, you know, we had a lot that shut down because some of the demand when people uh, weren't working or were working from home, uh, you know, went away. But at the same time, uh, they were very focused on, you know, can we get back up and going? And then is there going to be the capacity? And you're right, some of them shut down. Some of them had to accommodate to some new health guidelines and things along those lines. And I just know that we have resources that can get out the door. And we've been in communication with the uh, uh, with the, the person that they've hired to advocate for them uh, several times uh, as to what exactly it is that they need. I know I've, I've met with him and, and had a conversation. He said, you know, be crystal clear on what we can do uh, versus some of the impediments that they're facing that are not necessarily in our control. Well, one of the things they were concerned about, even as far as hiring people back, is that there is a um, hiring freeze. <laughs> so trying to work around that and, and get people in to actually get this money spent uh, it has just gotten very complicated. Well, we've pretty much lifted a lot of the hiring freezes that we've had. We still maintain a, a finger on the pulse of what's going on, but we have a, a lot of different dynamics in hiring at the state level that we've pretty much freed up. Uh, a lot of the agencies that if they have vacancies, what a lot of agencies hadn't uh, known to do, they might have vacancies in one area and they wanted to hire over here, therefore they were asking for a new position. And we've been having an awful lot of work of just having them repurpose positions. They have a mm -hmm. you know, position and they have resources for it, but let's get it repurposed. And, and some of the HR teams uh, have to be brought up to speed on that. Uh, actually, MSDE has been very good at uh, with the new superintendent in trying to repurpose some of the positions. And that's why I'm curious as to whether this was one of the venues that, uh, uh, that, that, that what challenges he's had here. Well, Senator, we'll reach out to MSDE and we'll make sure that they can move as expeditiously okay. as they need to get those that would be wonderful. back on staff. Good, especially thank this time you. of year is when we've got to get uh, all those child care facilities back up and going. Uh, just so we can get <laughs> yeah. people back in the workforce. Yeah, I think there's a problem. So many people ran out of money and they've even turned their licenses in. So we may have to even look at how we can, for people who want to apply for new licenses, how we can streamline that process. There's just a whole lot involved with it. Good. Thank you. Um, let's turn now to Delegate uh, Geraldine Valentino-Smith. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, 
for your willingness to help us all understand how all of this money was spent and being so transparent. And I appreciate in the beginning that you said this was going to be more of a general presentation. So what I wanted to do was ask you some questions about three populations of people. And if you can't now today, then certainly the questions will be out there and then we can get more detail from you. But the three populations are one, the population that was on temporary cash assistance, um, because there was the um, pandemic emergency assistant fund, which I think was $18 million to be spent on one time non reoccurrent um, expenses and how that was being spent out on the temporary cash assistance population, where we are with that and what is anticipated of when they'll hit the cliff of that money no longer being available or if there'll be any opportunity to kind of step that cliff down with the funding. And then the second is, as you said, the TDAP population. And of course they got extra money, a population that much needed the money even pre-pandemic, but a population that can't work um, and can only receive state or federal benefits to be eligible. So the plan for when that population, when they'll hit the cliff, when the money will be gone, and if there's a plan to use any of the additional money that appears to continue to be out there and available for the TDAP population. And then the third population tend to be almost the same. They're on SNAP benefits. Um, a lot of them are also TCA and TDAP, but the SNAP obviously a totally federal program where a significant amount of money was put in um, for additional food for families and individuals and the elderly. And then there was a new program that added a small federal increase. But unless the department applies for a waiver, and I understand that we might be only one of eight states that hasn't applied for the waiver yet, we're going to lose that additional federal money. So has a waiver been applied for at FNS within the FDA or are there plans to file a waiver? Because if we don't, um, that population is gonna really hit a cliff um, of losing significant amounts of money for food. So let's let's touch on the last uh, item first. And it's because uh, I know that on September 30th, the one program runs out, but the, but the subsequent federal program is scheduled to kick in uh, October 1st, the very next day. And I know that, <clears throat> that they have been uh, uh, communicating extensively with the, the recipients of that so that they're aware of the, the transition and, and uh, how that's to move forward. I think that program is supposed to go till December 31st. Uh, at least that was the, the provisions that, that uh, they had. And we have a meeting scheduled with uh, the department, I think November 15th or thereabouts. It's about halfway between that window so that we can have an update on, on what's going on. We'll have a better uh, picture of what uh, we have left over from the previous year. We still haven't had closeout on uh, 21 yet. Ordinarily, that happens before Labor Day. Uh, so the comptroller, you know, has uh, an awful lot of issues that they're trying to negotiate through there. And so we'll probably have a better picture along some of the, did you want to add anything? To, along no, I lines? think on, on those lines, we'll follow up with the Department of Human Services and kind of see sort of where they stand with regards to uh, filing an application. Uh, I know that uh, DHS had indicated that they did receive a waiver on some of the interviews and trying to follow up on that. That runs out uh, December 31st also. They were they planned to start all that back up uh, on just ensuring qualifications for January 1st. But again, you know, we'll have to see what, what uh, comes down from Washington and, and how we move forward along those lines. So hey, on the... Now, I just want to be clear that we're talking about, so when we get back in specifics, the different waivers, because it's the waiver to ensure that the additional federal money can continue to flow, not just the increase that was put into the food yeah. plan that came out. That was a small increase, but that there's another waiver. And I only raise that because the department has missed in history, historically some applications for some of these important waivers. So I appreciate your attention to that particular waiver. So here's something I'd request of you, um, only because I know that we have their departmental hearing coming up. Grant, it's not till November. Send me something. I know you've done it before, but if you can make it specific to this, uh, so that we can incorporate that in our conversation with them and see where they stand along those lines. The fact that we Thank get you. it to them 
uh, we we'll probably could get some feedback even before November 15th. And, uh, sure. No, thank you for that opportunity. We want to get all that federal money that we can for food, and I know you can help. And delegate on your uh, on your first two populations, right? So right now, uh, as part of the Recovery Now legislation that the General Assembly passed and the governor signed, we did an enhanced benefit um, of hundred dollars for both people in temporary cash assistance as well as in the temporary disability uh, program. Uh, as part of the negotiations around the ARPA dollars. Those that hundred dollar benefit is being extended through the end of this calendar year, uh, so that's the sort of the current plan. Uh, we have been having discussions with uh, uh, DHS about how they plan to spend the eighteen million dollars uh, pandemic emergency assistance fund, and maybe that would be, you know, that could be maybe the step down that starts to occur as the next calendar year begins. We're sort of still working that through. Okay, so I, thank you. I do know um, the work that we do with, with them. We hear them in our subcommittee um, and the advocates that hitting that cliff obviously is gonna be significant both to TCA and the TDAP population. So using that money as a step down probably would be very helpful both with TCA and TDAP. So I, I look forward to, to hearing more detail and, and working any way with you can um, on that population as they continue to endure the, the ramifications of COVID and probably historical underpayments as, as you know. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Senator Zucker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, good to see you. Madam Chair, always good to see you. Just a quick question. I got a call actually uh, over the last couple of days from uh, some of our local hospitals and I was just—I know that there's um, this healthcare reserve fund with COVID-19. I was just wondering if we were doing anything to—I know that um, you know we're still on the tail end. Hopefully, you know, hopefully the tail end of this pandemic and our health frontline workers are overextended and and having fatigue. So I was just wondering if any of this money is going to go to help retention or recruitment toward our healthcare workers, whether it's in uh, state-run medical facilities or, or private facilities. It's interesting that. Uh... A lot of you knew that, that Jim Brady died, and, and uh, uh, Bobby Neal and I had lunch on Friday as we headed to the funeral home to, to visit the family. And this is one thing that he brought up to me at lunch was just it's and it's you can look at it as a, a money issue is certainly one aspect to it, but the fact of the matter is a lot of us have burned out staff. And how are we going to to work with uh, you know just just some of some of them are saying I don't care what you pay me I'm done. <laughs> Uh, so how do we get uh, either a new wave of workers to, to come online, for maybe a poor choice of words, but, but those willing to step up, particularly as we have this variant, uh, you know, coming through and, and who knows what's on, on the backside of it. <clears throat> so certainly the money is part of it. And I think Bobby indicated to me it would be an HSCRC issue that they would have to, to incorporate in some of the conversations that they've had. Uh, we've not been involved in some of that, but it certainly is on the radar scope. I've brought it up with the chief of staff so that the governor's aware of it, and uh, it looks like it's going to be an overall strategy for something that we have to do. We already provide pretty decent benefits, uh, at least at the state level, on recruiting, trying to get some people on board, trying to do some loan forgiveness and some employment like that. That only helps the ones that we have. It doesn't help necessarily the hospital staffs. Uh, and some of those other nonprofits that are out there and, and some of the conversations they have. We certainly have some resources that we could uh, potentially allocate in that regard, but then we have to, to also make sure that we're not just throwing some money at a problem and not necessarily fixing uh, uh, the problem. It, because, because, you know, I can, I can foresee where you just, some people are, are just getting so fried and burned out uh, that they just can't, they can't handle it. We see that on the news all the time. I think Maryland's better prepared than a lot of the other states. We see Idaho having some of their citizens not being able to cross into Spokane, Washington for treatment. Why? Because those hospitals are filled up. But at the same time, I saw the report the other day where an ambulance uh, going into Cumberland had to be diverted 75 miles uh, with, with the patients they had to go into Kaiser, West Virginia. Things like that. Are you aware of any other conversations we've had? It's just, uh, it, there's a bigger problem than just allocating some of this money to it. And I think that's where the conversation needs to go. I see 
Senator Eckert nodding her head in agreement. So uh, she's certainly painfully aware of. Okay, uh, Delegate Solomon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Secretary Brinkley. Thank you for being here. Um, a lot of my colleagues touched on um, issues that were really important to me. I want to second the comments from Delegate Resnick and, uh, and Senator King's comments. Um, in addition to the, the grant writers, which is a new wrinkle. I know MSCE had some problems earlier this year and just getting their grants out quickly. So would uh, would second her comment, anything you can do at, at DBM to work with, with MSCE. And I know the, the new superintendent you know, is trying to uh, to rebuild rebuild the car as he drives it down the road, but anything you can do with them to make sure that those child care grants get out as expeditiously as possible to help uh, help save the save the community. Um, I, I guess my question is sort of along the lines of, uh, of what Senator Zucker raised, um, but rather than with the health sector, also in the education side, um, I was on the phone with some folks from uh, from our school system earlier this uh, this week, um, and I think you know we're down something like 100 bus drivers and short almost 700 staff. I know um, Senator Elfrith and the folks in Anne Arundel County are dealing with the same issue. Um, is there any thought, you know, potentially within this within DBM to allocate some of this money, you know, to some of our school systems to help? I mean, bonuses or any other sort of, uh, you know, measures that might allow us to recruit or bring in, um, you know, bring in staff to, to supplement some of these positions that, you know, we're just seeing attrition and, and, and you know, bleed out through, through again, uh, you know, exhaustion and, and the difficult circumstances that they're working under? Well, keep in mind, they, they certainly have a lot of challenges ahead of them, <clears throat> particularly when it comes to the transportation drivers. There were issues with CDL licenses and things like that you saw in Massachusetts brought in the National Guard to drive school buses and, and things like that. So that, again, is not necessarily unique to Maryland. I will point out to you, though, that they have plenty of resources in uh, the education arena that they have, because number one, Maryland provides an awful lot of resources to them. And then, as you saw in one of my presentations, there's an extra $2 billion going straight from the federal government might pass through to us. Uh, and, and Garrett County's issues in trying to find transportation or service workers or whatever it might be certainly would be far different from Montgomery's, which might be pretty close to Frederick's, but maybe not entirely like Frederick's, and then also uh, Wicomico. So they have plenty of resources at that stage uh, to try to address some of that. To what extent, if any of it is a licensing issue that the state then has some say in, like I say, with CDL licenses or things along those lines, uh, then we just need to hear from them along those lines. But uh, right now, uh, the resources seem to be uh, you know, right within the local control that they can they can allocate and reallocate some of it to however they, they feel that they need to and in whatever needs they need to. Do you have anything to add? I, I think the only point I would make is that, uh, you know, across uh, all of the sort of pandemic uh, programs for education, uh, local school systems have been allocated over $3 billion just in uh, you know, ESSER uh, three, that's about $2 billion. And generally uh, we've sort of looked at sort of those provisions and they are sort of very flexible as to how uh, local school systems can use those dollars. So I think maybe they need to maybe just get a little more creative about, uh, you know, how they use the, the, the money that they're already receiving. I, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that. I think there's also the, you know, I think most of the school systems have been using that specifically to either get buildings back open or on the learning loss, which I know has been a big priority. So just, I think we need to think more creatively as a whole on how to address this issue because we're all, we're all going to suffer, but I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Senator Eckert. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's overwhelming down here, and you're exactly right. I mean, there's a workforce shortage everywhere, everywhere. Um, we've done an economic tour around our jurisdiction, and a lot of units are having to shut down part of their operation because of lack of workforce. And I know you've sent down um, to each of the jurisdictions a big chunk of money and I don't know if there's any way that you can push or if the state side is pushed out to get that money out because it seems like it's sitting, um, whether, you wanted, whether we wanna get some expedited community health workers to help with vaccine resistance or whether it's um, getting another program and workers up and running, it seems to be that the money's 
kind of just um, sitting and there's no action on it. And I guess my question to you on the next question would be, I know you have a list of uh, helping some of the smaller municipalities and that's much appreciated because that's helpful for our infrastructure, wastewater treatment and some other issues, water issues. Um, but are you doing that same kind of reaching out and working with some of our smaller rural counties? Um, because it seems to me that again, we hear that there's funding there, but then that is not getting all the way down to where the people who need those funds. So my question, again, are you doing any of that support and inventory with our counties as well as our municipalities? And then is there any help available to them? Just on, yeah. or instructions or a reminder through communication chains you know, to get the funds out to where they need to be. Okay, uh, keep in mind, Senator, that uh, last year, when we had the first tranche of money that came through from the federal government, uh, a certain uh, portion of money was allocated to the governor and it was his decision to go ahead and share that <clears throat> with the local governments. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, five county governments had direct access to the treasury. The other 19 didn't, and uh, the governor made the decision to send that money to those counties. We made, <clears throat> again, this was very early on in the pandemic, so we made the decision that half of that money had to be allocated toward health-related expenses, whatever that might be, uh, and we did that. Then the counties requested, and they did receive the balance of the funds, just a check was or electronic draft was sent to the counties themselves. Uh, not all states did that. Uh, a lot of other uh, jurisdictions, the counties or the, the governor kept those resources internally. Uh, and so they didn't have that. Uh, with this uh, recent uh, batch of money, you know, I, I, it's, again, all direct. it's all direct. And more of the counties had a direct access and they have to, to account for it too, but they're still getting resources along those lines. Now, the counties, for the most part, more so than the municipalities, they have some level of financial astuteness and capacity and professionals that are dealing with it. They might, you know, Caroline's counties and Dorchester County might be not be certainly as extensive as Montgomery or Frederick, but they still have professionals in that in that room. On the MML team, some of those didn't have anybody that was doing it other than the, the treasurer who was a county councilman uh, who basically had to balance a checkbook and submit certain reports. And we see also through some of the uh, audits that we get when some of those uh, uh, municipalities or corporations, I guess, uh, have failed to, to meet certain audit trails. So uh, I, think, I think they have a higher threshold and a higher expertise to be able to accommodate some of it. When they had questions, uh, particularly we were on top of them. When I say we, I mean DBM. We were on top of them, the 19 originally, because we sent the monies out and we made them sign an agreement uh, that said, if there's any type of violation based on the federal audit that comes through, we're going to remove it dollar for dollar uh, from your income tax uh, uh, allocations. Therefore, we gave them the spreadsheet as to how to account for it. We answered questions. I know you answered an awful lot of questions uh, as to what was eligible, what's ineligible, and, and things along those lines. So if, if, if somebody gets down to a, a corner or something like that, we're happy to answer them uh, uh, or help them along any way we can. Our mission is always and has always been to try to get resources from the federal government, direct it <clears throat> at the local level uh, so that it can be delivered in regards to the pandemic. If it's a local health department, <clears throat> if it's a transportation issue, if it's something we can do with some of our staff at that level. But in these, uh, these matters where money was coming to flow through to them, our mission has been to get it in their pockets so they can take care of it because our thought also had been that they could take care of the problem sooner. It helps all of us out and we end up with fewer sick people and we can get back to some sense of normalcy quicker. Pardon me. Thank you very much. The other question I had, are there, that the money that comes down for rental assistance, um, does that also 
are there federal um, stipulations with regard to assisting uh, with mortgage payments as well, where families have been impacted by coronavirus? So, uh, Senator, so there are, are sort of two programs. There's the rental assistance program, which had a right. part one, which was part of the right. Carissa bill from December. The state got $401 million there. There was ERAP 2 that came part of uh, the American Rescue Plan. I want to say that's maybe another $350 million or so. And then there is a separate uh, source, uh, Homeowner Assistance Fund, which is, as you say, meant to help those folks that are having uh, challenges with their mortgage. Uh, Department of Housing and Community Development recently filed an application with the federal government to uh, receive that funding and is in the process of uh, developing rules and regulations. And there should be something out. I think they were talking about at our meeting uh, on rental assistance yesterday, probably within the next month, there'll be some um, you know, public announcement on how folks can begin to access those uh, dollars. Oh, great, because this just came up on a call today um, asking for flexibility that some of that those existing monies could be used for mortgage relief. But that answers my question. Perfect. Thank you very much. And then I just would say, as I started in the beginning, whatever we can do to exp expedite and get further up the um, the supply line for getting kids into employment sooner is going to be critical because I'm worried about a collapse of just the workforce without some kind of renewal going on there. Thank you. And, and uh, Thank you. As, as we transition to the next question, uh, I'll just point out that uh, Secretary Hope and his team have been very aggressive, very good, yeah. very creative. And they've been very forthcoming to us with some ideas on, hey, this is something we're hearing from the street. This is what ought to happen. And, and they're continually uh, knocking at the door asking for additional resources. That's not a criticism. It is a, a, a point that they're recognizing certain needs and these needs uh, vary throughout right. the states or throughout the, the counties and municipalities that we have. And they're trying to get to us. And, and they, they brought some ideas to us that they've recognized or heard from other uh, other, uh, uh, you know, people that, that are in his similar role in other states. It's been very good about that. They have. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Madam you. Chair, uh, as you can see, uh, budget and tax has really uh, stepped up to the plate uh, yes. to, your <laughs> to your challenge today. Um, we have one more from Senator McRae, and I, and, uh, I think uh, we'll need to move on after that, if that's good with you. I agree. Thank you. Okay. Senator McRae. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be very quick. Uh, Secretary Brinkley, it's always good to see you. Um, got a number of calls from um, some of my victim service providers about, you know, crime going up. Uh, they feel as though the uh, resources are declining, but just wanted to be able to get a better understanding if you could speak to some of the ARPA dollars or federal resources that have went to victim services. Thank you. Uh, my, uh, I mean, my understanding of it is you had, a, you had funds that were cut off at the federal level. And uh, so we're, we're still going back and forth on some of the proposed solutions that we have, identifying things that work versus identifying things that don't work. But there's a lot of criticism being directed at the state when, in fact, uh, the federal tap on those had been shut down, whether they had, whether they made the, the priority to direct it toward other things with COVID or not. I have no idea. We're not privy to those conversations. Anything you want to add? No. <clears throat> That, that's what we're dealing with is, that, you know, our, our source for the funding had been shut off. The tap had been shut off. Thank you. Okay. I think... Um, Looks like he's frozen. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Well, we have one more presenter. There he's back. Yeah, we thank, have thank you questions. all. And uh, <clears throat> again, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, I see he's back. Uh, feel free to email us and we'll help uh, in any way we can. Our mission is to just make sure that we have a, a back and forth. We're going to hit some roadblocks uh, or uh, some road speed bumps every now and then. But our mission is to make sure that we get the state back on uh, uh, terra firma, I guess, is one way to look at it. But at the same time, Maryland has done much, much better than other states in dealing with this. Uh, and in fact, if anything, 
uh, a lot of them are calling us up to say, hey, how'd you get there? Thank you. And by the way, I just want to uh, close this out by saying that our, our joint, uh, uh, the chair of our joint committee on federal relations, Delegate Carr, had to drop off. He had a couple of questions. I will forward them to you, uh, Mr. Secretary. I think you actually answered one, but uh, but I wanna make sure that you get uh, those questions answered for him. So thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you, Secretary. We're gonna go on now to the segment from the Maryland Association of Counties, uh, Kevin Canale. Right. Mr. Chairman and Madam Chair, uh, Kevin Canale here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties. Thank you so much for having me today. And I, I want to start off with a big thanks to Senators Cardin and Ben Holland. I have to say both of whom have been incredibly responsive and eager to hear from county leaders and their concerns. And, and we're fortunate to have that direct pipeline. I can tell you that's not the case in every state. And, and the importance of that direct connection is really, really apparent in times like this. We're also really grateful to, to DBM for their partnership. Um, we, we certainly view ourselves as a partner in sharing and serving our shared constituents. And, and they have been very informative and helpful along the way in working with us and helping us to navigate some of the federal requirements as well as the requirements installed by the state. So today I'm here to talk about ARPA and federal funds uh, from a county perspective. I think DBM did a really good job breaking down sort of all of the specifics but I'll talk a little bit more about the mechanics of the program, some of the nuts and bolts, and then I'll talk about where counties are today and some of the important considerations, challenges, and progress that, that we've made in getting these funds out the door to the people who need them most. So to start, I'll frame this conversation, but I think I have to remind everybody that you know county governments have really been on the front lines of this pandemic throughout the pandemic, from addressing the immediate health and safety concerns to providing households and small businesses with needed assistance, to ensuring that our residents have all of the most important and up-to-date information, and then also to standing up uh, robust testing and vaccine operations. We're extremely proud of the work that counties have done throughout this pandemic, and it's it's really been an all hands on deck effort. So when it comes down to to county ARPA funds, um, the American Rescue Plan Act provided $65.1 billion in direct aid to every county in America. That is through the state and local coronavirus fiscal recovery fund. That's part of ARPA. In total, Maryland counties expect to receive approximately 1.7 billion in direct federal aid. And for counties that comes in two tranches, 50% this year, 50% next year. And importantly, all of those funds need to be spent, spent down by December 31st of 2024. So what is the money used for? What, do we, what can we use this money for? Sort of a, a moving target as Treasury continues to revise its, its guidance. But really this funding is for essential immediate health and, and economic concerns, but also for, for helping to foster an equitable recovery through long-term sustainable programs and projects. And really it's about building resiliency for uncertain times ahead. So we're talking about important things like relief for households and businesses, vaccination and testing and PPE. We're bolstering social safety net services, public safety, mental and behavioral health. And then of course, making necessarily necessary investments to improve access to clean drinking water, investing in wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. And of course, closing the digital divide, which we know is top of mind for everyone. We also wanna make sure that we can address some of the systemic public health and economic challenges that have really contributed to the unequal impact of the pandemic. So when it comes to administering these funds that are sent directly to states and counties, the US Department of Treasury has been overseeing and administering this process, these payments, this aid to state and local governments. It's been a massive undertaking and you have to give Treasury a lot of credit. Um, They came up initially with with the general outline of ARPA and eligible expenses, reporting requirements and whatnot. And they've been regularly updating guidance for things like the eligible use of funds, compliance, and reporting. This summer, they they published an interim final rule, and we expect a final rule to to come out this fall. I will say, um, you know, normally, because of the the rapid nature of how this had to be rolled out, this is how it's supposed to work. Treasury is supposed to set the initial guidelines or whomever the the federal uh, government partner is, And then they're constantly in contact with the folks on the ground 
who are implementing these programs, which in this case really are state and local governments. And throughout that communication, they're addressing questions and concerns, and they're updating guidance in real time to make things more efficient and to eliminate roadblocks. So I have to give them a lot of credit. They've been a great partner to, to county governments, and they've worked closely with the National Association of, of Counties to quickly address these, these questions and concerns. So in terms of where we are today, in terms of ARPA, uh, counties, I said we have until December 31st, 2024 to spend those funds. So counties right now are developing plans to use these recovery funds strategically, again, to promote a strong and equitable recovery. We're very focused, like you heard from Secretary Brinkley, on a public and transparent process. We are gathering community input from nonprofits, from members of our community, other stakeholders through public surveys, websites, forums, et cetera, and so forth so that we can make sure we're really taking a holistic approach and how we decide to allocate these funds to, 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 to do all those things I said we need to do. And so, so some of the important considerations and challenges here, number one, I've mentioned it, the evolving guidance and compliance. Again, Treasury is doing a great job, um, but they don't really have a manual for ARPA. They've been doing this through revised FAQ documents, which is highly unusual for a program like this. But again, it's, it's really important to, to make clear that they almost have to do it that way because there was just no time to get this up and running with all of that input already embedded in the process. Um, another thing that we're trying to make sure we do is, is maximizing every dollar. I mean, you can only spend this money once. This is not ongoing funding. So we really wanna make sure that we're thinking about this as a one-time expenditure and making sure that we avoid long-term operational costs because again, this money is going to dry up eventually. We're also trying to avoid duplication of efforts, uh, you know, so with ARPA dollars not covering the same things that maybe other federal resources are already covering. Uh, so there are a lot of moving parts in that regard. We have multiple buckets of money, right? We have the CARES Act, which was all the way back, seems like 10 years ago, but it was just last year in March. Uh, they passed the CARES Act. We have CRF funds. That money expires December 31st of this year. And so trying to figure out each bucket has different eligible uses. Each bucket has different expiration deadlines. And so really trying to make sure that we're spending the money that expires the soonest first, getting that money out the door so that we don't lose it. And that also becomes complicated. I think it was mentioned earlier, maybe from Senators Cardin and, and Ben Holland, that one of the big things, the unknowns, is that we do have a massive infrastructure bill pending in Congress. It's well overdue. We're excited about the prospect. But from a county perspective, when you're trying to decide how to allocate ARPA funds, some of the uses are for water and stormwater infrastructure and for broadband, all of which would be included in a new infrastructure bill that could come down the line. So you don't want to book ARPA funds uh, for, for things that you may be getting soon in an infrastructure bill. So trying to put all these puzzle pieces together and make sure that we're doing this in the most efficient way possible is certainly something that, that is, has been challenging uh, multiple deadlines, multiple you know, rules and regulations for different pots of money uh, certainly is not something that is ideal, but we're getting through it and I think we're making a lot of progress. So when we talk about getting money out the door, specifically, I know we're interested here in, in eviction relief. DBM provided a good overview of ERAP funding. Um, counties, some counties with populations over 200,000 received direct money from uh, Treasury to, 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 to deal with this. And DHCD is administering the rest of the money for the rest of the counties uh, with populations of under 200,000. This is a big undertaking. It comes with a lot of challenges. And I'll go through a few of those and talk about ways that we're trying to mitigate them. So initially, there were a lot of questions regarding applicants need, needing to prove a COVID-19 related loss. A lot of confusion and inconsistencies about what that meant. And I think that complicated things at least initially. Um, I mentioned earlier the challenges with multiple funding sources, multiple buckets of money, each coming with its own requirements and spend down deadlines. This certainly requires additional staff, additional training, and you know, grant writers and folks who understand this stuff and can really get into the weeds, um, they're a hot commodity right now. And so it, it has been challenging in some counties to find and recruit the people that can, can handle this and, and know what they're doing in terms of such a massive undertaking. Now, those folks are hard to find. Um, it also does, those multiple buckets of money, I think also it's fair to say that's created some confusion 
about actually how much money has gone out the door. Some counties at the onset of the pandemic set up their own eviction relief programs with county money. So we're still drawing those down. We're also still drawing down, in many cases, CRF funds from the CARES Act, which again, those must be spent by the end of the year. So I think when we look at the amount of ARPA money and, and rent relief, uh, eviction prevention money that's included there, some of this other stuff may not be included in, 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 in the dashboard, if you will, that the state is using to, to sort of tell us how much money is going out, because that's not necessarily accounting for county funds that were already in place and we're spending those down. And then also making sure we get the CARES Act, done, <clears throat> excuse me, CARES Act money out the door fast and first, because that has to be spent by the end of the year. Uh, we're also seeing uh, some, some challenges with uh, federal regulations regarding significant document requirements for both tenants and landlords before they can receive assistance. Uh, it's a wide range of documents and, and oftentimes securing all of those documents requires mul multiple follow-ups to both uh, renters and tenants. So that can delay processing, but we're trying to smooth that out and we're working with the federal government to, to, to make some progress. So I'm happy to report that the biggest challenge that we've had has been uh, addressed by the, the, the Biden administration and by the Department of US Treasury. And that is to do with application process delays. And I mean, I mentioned earlier, Treasury has been a great partner and it was actually multiple Maryland County housing directors on a call with Treasury and the Biden administration. And a, a shout out to Senator Rosa Pep, who I think helped to organize that um, and others on that call. And they explained to Treasury and the Biden administration that you know, the application verification requirements were cumbersome and actually sometimes contradictory. Treasury responded, and now they've expressly allowed for self-attestation and documenting eligibility for rental assistance, which again was really the single biggest choke point for getting this money out the door quickly and efficiently. So I think that's a really important piece of this puzzle, and it removes a lot of the major roadblocks to getting this money in the hands of people that need it the most. And I think you're seeing that in the July numbers, and we expect to see this money getting out the door uh, more and more quickly as, as we move along. So I just wanna mention other county efforts to, to do this expeditiously. Uh, we are partnering with nonprofits to expedite these payments. Um, you know, This is something I equate to the census efforts and vaccination efforts. We're trying to make sure that we are in touch with those trusted community partners. Those are the people that can reach the hard to reach populations. And often those hard, really, hard to reach populations are gonna be the least likely to reach out and seek help. And so they may not trust the government, but they may trust people in their community, maybe at their house of worship, maybe at the Lions Club, wherever it may be, we wanna make sure that we're getting the nonprofit community engaged with the people that need it most. And we've really, really been partnering with them and they've been great partners for us. So we're also working closely with district courts. We're receiving dockets for failure to pay rent cases before they're heard. And then we're providing staff to contact those landlords and clients prior to the eviction hearing uh, and prioritizing assistance for clients with pending evictions. We're also encouraging landlords to batch applications for multiple tenants and, and, and then submit them so that we can, we can speed up that application process by filing multiple applications at once. Uh, we're also making sure to, to engage with targeted marketing, advertisements on buses and other media to make sure that people know about these resources that are available to them. The Maryland Association of Counties, what, what are we doing? We've hosted multiple meetings and breakout sessions to connect county leaders with our state and federal partners, walk through this evolving guidance. We're acting as a liaison between counties and the state and our federal partners. And then we're making sure that our counties have the most up-to-date information so that they can share that with their constituents as well. We will be hosting another ARPA forum on September 29th, which will include our state and nonprofit partners as well. So I just, I'll, I'll wrap up with this. There's no doubt that there were challenges in building the assistance infrastructure needed you know, to get these funds out the door quickly to eligible households from scratch, right? Nobody's ever done this before. It's a big undertaking. But the, the, the data that we're seeing is encouraging and we expect the September numbers to look even better. We counties remain focused on getting help to, to people that need it most. Uh, when it comes to rental assistance, that's both tenants and landlords. And we remain committed to working closely with our state and federal partners to streamline this assistance and for prioritizing a swift, robust, and equitable recovery. So Mr. Chairman, Madam Chair, I will leave it there and I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, I appreciate the invite and I do want to express appreciation to you all, as well as to DBM and our federal partners 
for, for really being wonderful partners for us to, to try and help as many people as we can and get this money out the door quickly. Thank you, very good. Any questions? I tried to put my hand up, but it didn't go up. Jim Rosenberg. Okay, go yes. ahead. Good, Senator. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Very quickly, I, I do wanna thank the county, their work uh, with the Treasury Department to clarify those issues because uh, it was a very big blockage and the Treasury, the Biden Treasury Department moved very swiftly to answer the concerns from the Maryland housing directors that yeah. fixed the tree in terms of clarification about yeah. uh for income. So that was a big step forward and, and your folks in the county deserve a lot of credit for that. My question is, when are we gonna get the, the December results to see what's really out the door? So I, I think that, that that's coming. I know that DBM has their dashboard and I know that uh, that updates monthly is, is my understanding. Counties like the state have submitted the necessary reports to the U.S. Treasury. Those were due last month. And so I'm not sure what Treasury plans on doing with that information and whether or not they plan on releasing some nationwide numbers about what's what's happening. Um, I can I'll get back to you. I'll talk with the state and with DBM to see exactly how we're going to to display those numbers. And I know if you go to any county government website, you'll find that there is a lot of transparency and they have their own data, data dashboards as well in terms of how much money they've received, what they're doing to get it out. But I can follow up with you a, a, after talking with the state to see how the state plans on releasing that those metrics. Yeah, I think all of us would appreciate it if we can get the Maryland numbers as soon as possible after the end of September. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Madam Chair, I think we can wrap it up at this point. Thank you very much as always. Yep, so uh, uh, I thought it was a, a great afternoon. It was important uh, information um, and uh, I'm grateful to all our presenters and, uh, and of course to you um, and all the house members. Um, so uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Let's have a great uh, rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Take care.